GG, welcome back to the show. Hey, Stefan. Thanks so much for having me again. Love your work, man. You've been doing so much awesome stuff. The way you write and speak in the space, it's uh, unmatched, I have to say. Uh, you've done some really cool pieces of work uh, over the year, and uh, I just wanted to get you on and talk a little bit about it. And Of course, th there's going to be lots of crazy things happening in, in, the, in the Bitcoin world right now. Um, I'm actually in Dubai right now for uh, Tone Bay's conference. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's uh, so that's that's on in a, in a day or so. So I'm just getting ready, getting a few things around, yeah. ready for that. Um, but uh, yeah, I guess let's start with uh, where, 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 where where your where's your head at with uh, Bitcoin these days? Yeah, I think I think you're absolutely right. It's gonna get crazier and crazier, and it's it's almost impossible already to keep up. You know, like uh, there, there there was a time where it was possible to attend every conference and just uh, also keep up to date up to date with all the developments and i think this this kind this time is coming to an end now <laughs> so you you kind of have to specialize i feel like and you know a lot of people are specializing on lightning others on mining others on the, the pure energy side of mining you know and uh, like there's so much stuff going on it's very hard to keep up and i just i i try to keep up i i try to to um kind of have an overview of what's going on but i also want to drill down into some topics uh, more deeply and and currently i think um to me lightning is one of the most exciting things i mean there, there are many exciting things going on but i think lightning is awesome it's awesome that it works it's awesome that it's <laughs> it's awesome that it's used it's awesome that it scales and uh yeah i i feel like we are at a tipping point where uh, bitcoin is kind of ready for the next step yeah that's awesome to hear so what's uh the latest on your 21 ways which is the follow-up to 21 lessons for listeners who haven't already make sure you check out gg's book 21 lessons but uh what's the latest on that yeah i'm still working on it um i actually uh, started sitting down again seriously and writing more so i'm uh back to <laughs> trying to write every day you know i'm <laughs> trying to do other work during the day and writing uh, either very early in the morning or late at night and yeah it's coming along i would say it's uh, approximately 40 to 50 percent done um so i have some chapters that i'm uh, polishing off and i intend to publish soon so most people probably have read bitcoin is time which is one of the chapters and i want to you know like if if, if a chapter can stand alone then i want to publish it uh, even before the book is published and again my plan is to do it very similar like i did it with 21 lessons just release everything out in the open and release it under a permissive license and yeah in the end i hope a, a book will pop out um i was aiming for end of 2021 but that's <laughs> that's probably way too optimistic now but i'll i'll say like um you know early next year might be a a, a good time to see everything um come together but i also know you know like the the last five percent of a big project uh is, is always um <laughs> the most difficult one so i have no no illusions that it's gonna um be done on its own or or go easily yeah and as you mentioned Bitcoin is Time is one of the chapters from that book, which is a great post, and that's available on your website, dergg.com, and also on the swanbitcoin.com website. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that article? I thought it was really fascinating in terms of reframing a few things and putting things in an interesting light. And obviously, in preparation for my discussion with you, I, I went back over that article. But uh, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I think reframing is the right word because um, I think we are all still as uh, <laughs> people that um work in and with bitcoin and just discuss bitcoin a, a lot we're all trying to figure out what bitcoin is and that's also what 21 ways is going to be about i i try to look at bitcoin in 21 different ways and one of the ways you can look at bitcoin is just purely using the time aspect to make sense of it because one of the things that bitcoin does is that it decentralizes time itself so one of the unsolved problems in uh, like a, a digital cash system in doing money on the internet was uh, digital time stamping because you 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 need to tell the time in order to make sense of the events that are happening in a network so you you need a, a, an error of time to be able to tell like a came before b and so on and so forth and for money that is terribly important because if you mix up the events you uh, either create money out of thin air or you know you you're suddenly able to double spend money and so on and so forth and so what satoshi um like satoshi's main insight was that we we have to decentralize 
the timestamping server as well. And we have to decentralize time in a way. And that's what proof of work actually does. So that's what miners are actually doing. Miners are kind of offering a, a, a new <laughs> timestamp to, to, to the network that you can't cheat because it's, it's rooted in, in proof of work. And, and you kind of have to do it this, this way because like they're very, I think there are very deep reasons why you have to do it this way. Because in, in our relativistic universe, there is no absolute time in the first place. So you could not have uh, an absolute time in a decentralized net network in the first place. And so I try to explore all these things in, in Bitcoin this time. And I, I try to, you know, go through all the relevant literature that uh, also Satoshi referenced in the white paper, you know, like I think five out of eight references were about timestamping. So it's, it's a very important topic. And I think not, not a lot of people um, looked at Bitcoin in that way. And I think that's why it resonated so well. Yeah, I think that you're right there. And one thing that I have seen online, and perhaps this is amongst people who are maybe newer to Bitcoin and first learning about it, they think of it in a different way. They're thinking of it like, when they mention time, they're thinking of it like, oh, it's stored time. Like when you work, you go and store away some time. Yeah. I actually think that's wrong. It's, that's not, it's <laughs> yeah. not precise. It's, 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 Money it's, it's, also, tr it's also true, but that's not what the, what the piece was about. So I, I, I exactly. think, I think, I think it's, it's true to like, it's a, it's a fair point that, that money is stored time and stored energy in a sense, but it's the, my, my main, I, my, my main insight was that, um, there, there's two ways to do money. And this, this has been true historically always. You can either use physical artifacts like, you know, cowrie shells or gold coins or silver coins or something, something that you can't pass around, something that, that truly has a physical instantiation in the real world, something that you can give to someone else, something that you can hand over, you know? And this, this money works really well because it keeps track of, of itself. Whoever possesses the gold coins has the money, period, you know? And this has downsides, of course, you know? You can steal it, <laughs> you can forcefully take it away, and so you can lose it, and so on and so forth. And the, mm. and, uh, but the, the, the benefit is that you don't need a centralized authority to keep track of who owes what to whom. The coins kind of keep track of themselves or their shells and so on and so forth. And um, the second way to do money is lists. And then you will always have a list keeper and then you immediately run into the problem of timekeeping because you need to, you need to make sense of the order that is kept in the list. So, so every, every ledger is kind of, um, it, it, it records what happened in the real world. And this is exactly the, the, the problem that you, you have a recording of what happened in the real world and you have the real world. And if you use tokens or if you use gold coins, then, then the coins, they keep track of themselves. Like the physical artifacts keep track of themselves. And once you create a record of things, the record and the real world, they are inherently disconnected. And this is, um, I, I had a, a thread that kind of blew up and uh, I also gave it a talk in Germany about this topic um, that in general, the map is not the territory. Like if you, if you create a map of something, it is disconnected from the territory itself. And if the territory changes, you have to, you have to update the map. The map does not auto automatically update itself magically. And this is also true for, for money. If you are using a list as your source of truth as your money, and which is what we are doing, which is, you know, like central banks have a list of all the entries and uh, like banks in general, this is how money works. And if you go back thousands of years, like those are the two forms of money that we have. We either have physical artifacts in terms of shells or coins and so on, or we have lists. And if you has, have lists, someone has to take care of the list. Someone uh, usually a centralized authority takes care of the list and if you have a list you also have like a single source of time and this is this is a huge problem in the in the in the digital realm you can only have lists like you cannot have tokens in the in the digital realm like you cannot have something that actually moves from a to b like this is the root of the double spend problem because we you're, you're dealing with information so to move information you always have to read it copy it and delete the original. Like this is, this is the whole problem. <laughs> and, exactly. and so that even comes to digitally when you're trying to have this idea of digital property. Well, in, on the internet, anyone can copy things. And so yeah. this also comes into, I think a more deeper way of thinking about what even is a property right. And so people like Stefan Kinsella, who have done very well on the intellectual property aspect of it. And if you talk to him, the way he might explain property rights is to say, look, you can only have property rights in things that are scarce. And so in that yeah. sense, I guess he would argue that you can't actually own a Bitcoin, but I guess we would say really you can 
be the unique controller of that exactly. Bitcoin. Maybe that's another way to think yeah. of it, right? So just for listeners who, are, who aren't familiar, when you hold Bitcoin, really, it's like you're holding the private key for those coins. And so that private key, it's actually like a huge, huge, imagine just like a massive, massive number. And really what our Bitcoin wallets and our Bitcoin nodes are doing, the software will kind of take that number and then kind of derive out, oh, okay, here's the private key, here's the public key, here's an, and then from that, here's an address. Okay, GG, now you can pay me to this address to which I control the, that those coins or that unspent output, yeah. right? Yeah, I think that's a great point. And I, I love Stefan Kinsella's work. Uh, we had a, a brief exchange on Twitter. I don't think he read Bitcoin is time yet because he, he had some questions that are actually answered in the piece, but uh, I think he, he did not uh, do the work and actually read up on it and tried to understand it in a deep way. But he is right that uh, ownership um, is, is different and difficult in, in when it comes to information. And I would also agree, this is also why I use you know open source licenses and very permissive licenses for everything I do online because uh, I, I think bits and bytes should not be owned. I think, you know, something like DRM or something like paywalls, it, it just doesn't work. You know, like you can you can copy. The reason why it doesn't work is exactly to his point because it is not scarce. You can, you can copy information at zero marginal cost you know it doesn't cost anything to <laughs> copy and paste like that's <laughs> so <laughs> that's that's just how information works if you can if you can make sense of the information if you can read it then you can also copy it that's why every um anti-copying mechanism will always be pro broken and like you have to go through insane lengths to stop people from copying digital information and it, it never works in the end but anyway like to your point about uh ownership and control. I think also Max Hillebrand wrote about it uh, very nicely, where he, he says it's about um, simulating ownership, so to speak. And you simulate ownership by, ha by having um, like, you're the only person that has knowledge about this information. Because it, when, it, when it comes down to it, as you said, a private key is a number. And uh, it's it's a, a philosophical argument that doesn't really hold up if you say you can own a number, you know, like I, I own the number three, like this is nonsensical to say. And it, it, the, the argument doesn't really change if the number is so large that no one else will ever come up with the number. You, you still don't own it, you know, like it's it, because there you, you could have collisions as well, you know, like uh, I, I could theoretically um, guess your private key, for example, I could come up with the same number. And uh, then and, and this is this is why ownership in Bitcoin is so tricky, because um, this is not like a, a theoretical point, because you can tweet out your private key. And then the question who owns these Bitcoin becomes very difficult because it's it's a lot of people that suddenly have access to to your Bitcoin and can move it and have to have the power to control it. And I think ownership always comes down to control in a sense, because in the end, you know, what do you own? You, you, you own your body, hopefully, you know, like this. Uh, I think this is one of the base axioms, even though uh, it seems that <laughs> this axiom is currently under attack. And if you own property, it is about you can do with this property like what you please like you can buy something and you can throw it away the next day and if you have a house if you own a house uh, you are in charge of what happens with this house but it's always about control because um you know if a highway is built and you have to you know your house is in the way <laughs> you're not owning your house anymore because you don't have control of of what happens and then uh, it, it won't be your house any longer so i think ownership and control they, they are uh, kind of two sides of the same coin, if you will, you know, like it's if you own something, you have complete control over it usually. And in the informational realm, ownership is kind of knowledge. So you, you are the only one who knows about this number. Yeah. And speaking of time and the way Bitcoin works as this sort of decentralized time keeping in, in a sense, because we have to keep track of the order of the transactions. And so I guess that's a very important part in Bitcoin. Now, there are different ways to talk about this. For example, Peter Todd explains it very simply. A blockchain is a chain of blocks. And so it's about what is that order of blocks and the, you know, the transactions that get included into each of those blocks. And so there's a certain sense of causality in that chain. And you explain some of this. Uh, you explain this in the article around how Bitcoin as a system creates that uh, chain and we actually have to rely on some level of unpredictability 
in order to get that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think, you know, um, I think Peter's comment about the blockchain being a, a chain of blocks, it's, it, <laughs> I think it, uh, it, he came up with, with the saying uh, when everyone was talking about blockchain and every, everything like, you know, uh, 16, 17, around uh, those times where uh, the whole world tried to blockchainize everything and the word kind of lost its meaning. And he just tried to point out, I think, that it's a very simple data structure that also existed before, you know, like it's, it's not a new idea to uh, chain things together, so to speak. And um, like even even outside of computer science, this this idea exists in like there are some some folklore songs, for example, that always refer back to the previous ver verse and you have to include what you said before in what you're saying now. Or there's this children children's game, you know, like where uh, I'm going to holiday and I'm packing this and that and that in my suitcase and the next child has to uh, say everything again what the previous child said and add, add one more, you know, like that's that's the same idea basically because uh, it makes rewriting history very expensive that's what it's about you know and the problem with uh, rewriting history for computers is like even if you even if you chain everything together a computer can trivially rewrite history and this is the problem with proof of stake by the way like proof of stake because it has no anchor in the physical world i can take my computer and generate a valid proof of stake chain um, that is as valid from an outsider's perspective without any additional information as the the quote unquote correct chain. And what what uh, Bitcoin does so beautifully is it, it takes a physical anchor via proof of work. It takes real physical energy and embeds it in the data. And this builds up over time. So, you know, people use metaphors like amber, like uh, if, if you build something up over, over time, I, I also like to think of uh, stalactites or, you know, like a large tree and you have the rings of the tree that build up over time. And this is how Bitcoin works. So it, it takes time and energy to, to build up um, the, the time chain, you know, like and that's why, why, why Bitcoiners are also switching uh, to the terminology of the time chain and, and refuse to say blockchain because it kind of became meaningless over the years, you know, like if, if someone comes to you and, and, and tries to explain to you how the, the blockchain will revolutionize everything, the, the chances that they understand Bitcoin is, uh, is very low, you know, and uh, <laughs> I think this is a, a proper reaction to just, you know, um, kind of <laughs> give up the term maybe uh, and switch to something else that might be more appropriate. And yeah, you need, you need, um, you need a, a source of unpredictability unpredict to build up time in the, in the first place. Like if you could predict it, it wouldn't be a good arrow of time because you could say what, what's going to happen in the future. And so you need a source of unpredictability. And in, in Bitcoin, of course, this is the proof of work puzzle. But it's not only that, it's also the transactions that will be included and that are broadcast. So you, ha you have multiple sources of unpredictability in Bitcoin. And once um, the like once the block is mined and once it's it's a valid block and it gets added to the chain of blocks then it's kind of embedded in time so so i i view i view for example the mempool the transactions that are in in the mempool as timeless and as, as soon as they are embedded in the time chain they have a time assigned to them and so in, in a sense bitcoin slows down time and it has to do that you know like otherwise th other, otherwise things are too chaotic like you you cannot syn synchronize anything without slowing down, down time because of relativity and other effects you know like that it, it's absolutely impossible and so it slows down um, the ticks of the clock so that it ticks every 10 minutes uh, on average and it but it still needs an anchor to the real world like that's absolutely to our human time that's absolutely essential and this is actually one of the problems that nick sabo was not able to figure out because um the problem with digital cash was computers get faster and faster and faster all the time and so if you mine something with proof of work and and you use those like uh, reusable proof of works and all, all the systems that, that came before um you you always had to see when were the coins mined because you know like if if the computers get faster and faster and faster and they're now like 10 trillion times faster than they were like 20 years ago then <laughs> i make all your past coins worthless uh, by just being able to produce so much more and this is very important also for issuance and issue, issuing coins fairly because you want to spread out the issuance over long periods of time and if you would not have the difficulty adjustment and if we were not able to keep a constant 10 minute 
uh, block time, then all the bitcoins would be mined already. You know, like like the, <laughs> you you would get you know as as soon as this thing has any value, uh, some people that are in charge of supercomputers uh, just you know kick in the door and mine everything, and and then the party is over. So the difficulty adjustment is the is the magic sauce that makes everything work. And the important thing about the bit, the difficulty adjustment is that it's it's keeping a constant to the time, not to energy, not to hash rate, not to anything else, you know? Like you have to, you have to, like if you want to build the soundest money on earth, you have to link it to time because time is the ultimate resource. Time is the only thing we can't make more of. If you would link it to energy, for example, like people would, would build like, you know, cold fusion reactors or something. And then again, you know, you could, you could make Bitcoins for free basically. And so you have to link it to time. And I mean, there are other reasons as well, but, but just the scarcity aspect of it, I think is a very important one. Yeah, I, excellent explanation there. I loved around the difficulty adjustment. It is such a crucial thing. And so uh, an interesting point for listeners is that many of the pieces existed. It was actually that Satoshi found a way to combine them in a novel way and add the difficulty adjustment in, in this way that made it feasible and poss possible where other projects had failed and other, yeah, other attempts had failed. Yeah, absolutely. And it's it's very hard to kind of see at first what is the innovation in Bitcoin, because as, as you're saying, you know, everything kind of existed before. He just took existing puzzle pieces and, and glued them together in this weird game theoretical, like very esoteric way. And also most people did think that it would work at first, you know, like that's the that's the the, the first reaction to Bitcoin is basically, you know, this will never work like it. It, it can probably be gamed <laughs> or broken or, or whatever, but it turns out that it works beautifully and, and by uh, I, I would I would say you know by uh, a combination of genius insight and also luck he, he was able to um, come up with consensus parameters that that actually do work you know like because there is no reason why it's why it's like uh, 100 million sets in a Bitcoin and 21 million Bitcoins and 10 minute block time and and so on and so forth and like even the block size everything was like you know um, like uh, let's guess what 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 kind of parameter we we should pick and let's see let's see if it works you know <laughs> in the very early days I, I think that, that that was the the approach and it turns out that it absolutely works and I think what most technologists miss is that the, the most important thing about Bitcoin is the, the the promise of the unchanging system and the promise of the scarcity you know like you you have the scarcity promise that is embedded in the promise that this that the consensus rules will not change and so this is why the history of bitcoin is also so important and uh, no other like no other project has this history where uh, you know it was attacked it, it uh, a lot of people with a lot of impl influence tried to change it and i, I can urge um, uh, all your listeners to read the the block size war and just look into this period of uh, like of history of Bitcoin, which was insanely important. And I think this is why the confidence in the system grew so dramatically um, after this period, because Bitcoin was actually able to fight it off. And we see how resilient the system is now, like with, uh, you know, the, the China mining exodus and things like that. And Bitcoin is just able to shrug it off and chug along. And I think this is what a sound money needs to do. You know, like it, it has to be rock solid. Yeah, very interesting. And I think that's also keying back to what Mises explained about sound money. He mentioned it in two ways. One is that it's uh, freely chosen by uh, the market, and two that it's not in, not um, by the by the cent, by government intervention. And so Bitcoin's ability to resist government intervention is actually part of the system. It's part of the deal, and it's part of how we're actually going to make sound money again, rather than the unfortunately the gold bugs who seem to <laughs> think that asking the government nicely is going to work when clearly it hasn't yeah and it's never going to and even if we did go back to a government gold standard who's to say in another five or ten years when there's a crisis they'll say oh it's an emergency we need to end the gold standard again oh don't worry this is just a temporary suspension of your ability to redeem in specie meaning your ability to actually change your fiat coins or fiat tokens back for the real gold which was the, back in the old system that was that was the promise yeah. and unfortunately the fiat system simply can never make the promises that the Bitcoin system can. 
Yeah, absolutely. And uh, but I, I also, I mean, I, I say this repeatedly. I have a lot of sympathy for people that that have their uh, trouble wrapping their head around it because you kind of you have to understand what how the fiat system operates. You have to understand gold in a deep way. You have to understand the evolution of money. You have to understand the history of money and everything that went wrong. And you have to understand Bitcoin to make sense of it all and to to see the promise of Bitcoin and uh, to see how powerful it is. And it's also very hard to kind of um, parse apart bitcoin in a way because it is this this um <laughs> yeah i i i often uh like i think the the most apt metaphor for bitcoin is that it's it, it has to be seen as its own like biological organism it, it is its own kind of thing and very much like you it, you know i i can take you apart stefan but you would not be happy about it like if i if i take out your your arms and your heart and your liver and and, and just inspect how everything operates you will you will stop operating you know <laughs> the same is true for bitcoin and it is this like two parts math one parts physics one one part um like um uh, biology you know because in the end it's it's users that run the nodes and it, in the end you you have a, a sort of uh, rough consensus um, around, for example, soft forks before the consensus is written into code and before the, the code becomes active and the code is a, the consensus rules are adopted by nodes and the network upgrades and so on and so forth. So, so you have this biological um, social aspect as well. And um, I, I like to think about the different types of monies in, in this kind of uh, 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 as a vector along multiple dimensions. And fiat money, for example, is like purely political and you could you could like uh, political sounds so positive it, it it has the force of violence behind it so so you have to force people to use it otherwise no one would use it and that's your point about you know like sound money has to emerge on the free market like that's that's just uh austrian economists take this as, as a given because you know like the best money will emerge without the use of coercion without the use of force and if you if you look at gold for example you know like gold is not mathematical gold is purely physical but gold also has the property of, of um uh, allowing for individual sovereignty you know you can go out and mine gold you can <laughs> create your own gold coins you can store them under your mattress you don't have to ask anyone for permission you know i mean it's it's in this day and age, it's very hard to, you know, <laughs> do this at scale and so on and so forth. But I, I think Bitcoin combines um, like the best of multiple worlds. And it is, uh, it, it is, it is like purely mat mathematical in a sense. And it is also physical. It puts the individual at the center. So that's, I think that's one of the hardest things to explain about Bitcoin, that you are in charge of Bitcoin. You definitely are Bitcoin. You are the Bitcoin network. You are who is running it if you use Bitcoin properly. Because a lot of people speak about Bitcoin as like, you know, it's this democratic thing, for example. But Bitcoin has nothing to do with democracy. Like you can, like you, you are, Bitcoin is like a, a group of kings and you are the king, you know? <laughs> like, <laughs> I like that that's, analogy. That's, that, a good one. That, that's what's Bitcoin going on. Kings. Yeah, it's, it's like <laughs> if you use... Bitcoin properly, like if you run your own node and if you hold your own keys, that's what's going on. Like no one can interfere with with uh, your idea of Bitcoin. No one can force anything upon you. And and so so Bitcoin scores well, very well on on the uh, individual sovereignty uh, dimension and on the math dimension and on the physics dimension. And it scores very badly on the politics dimension. You know, like there, uh, it, it's not political money in the sense that someone else dictates what it is. I mean, Satoshi kind of did with version zero point one, but you know that's it. Like that's <laughs> that's what we have, mm. and that's why um, you know, like twenty one million is non negotiable. That's like if if. Uh, and I'm not saying this to the world. I'm saying this to myself. Like, if if you want to change Bitcoin, be my guest. But I'm I'm gonna keep using my Bitcoin. Yeah. And on this whole idea of time, uh, it's an interesting one that I see a lot of Bitcoin people use block time as a marker. And I see even in, uh, for example, in some of your articles or on your website, you might mention, okay, the block was, you know, here was the block height. This is the block height of the network. So meaning this was the chain tip at the time uh, that my article was published or other people do things like maybe the block height at the time their child was born that uh, or the time they got married or different things like this. Uh, and I know, actually you mentioned Max Hillbrand. He's a bit of a block time maximalist himself. So uh, do you think we are 
uh, going to move into a world where block time becomes taken more seriously, Gigi? Uh, oh, I'm I'm definitely already living in this world. So um, I, I, <laughs> I I helped launch a, a, a German podcast uh, called Ein und uh, If anyone yeah. speaks German, uh, just uh, check it out. It's just the num the number twenty one, but uh, like written not as a number, but as the word. And we start every episode by reading out the uh, block time, and uh, we started adding Moscow time when the meme popped up. So it's a very nice. <laughs> If you go back and, and you, 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 you listen to the block times and the Moscow times, it's, it's very funny. But I think, you know, because the, the past in Bitcoin doesn't change, like if you go a, a few blocks down, it's a very nice um, record keeping device. And, you know, there are no time zones in Bitcoin, which is also very nice. You know, like it's, it, for example, um, on, on my side, everything I publish, I, I use uh, the, the block I, I pressed publish is, you know, the time this thing was published. And you are free to look up, um, uh, this block and figure out for yourself what the time was in your time zone. You know, like I, I don't have to figure it out for you. Like it's, it's, it's very easy. It's a way cleaner system. The problem with block time is that it's very hard to, um, define events in the future. So if you, if you're <laughs> saying like we, we want to meet at block time, I don't know, like <laughs> 800,000 that, that it's, it's going to be like you might, you might be waiting for a week or two. So you, you never know. <laughs> you never know when the next block is coming in, but it's like on average, it's going to be 10 minutes, but of course it, it fluctuates. Right. Uh, let's say uh, you and I are going to meet at the steakhouse to eat some steak. And I'm like, oh, GG, I'm late. Uh, and you're like, oh, how, how late will we be? I'll be like, oh, I'm one block away. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so so it's it's very good time in, in some sense, but it's for for human affairs. I think we're we're stuck with our regular clocks for the foreseeable future. <laughs> for now, <laughs> um, yeah. So actually, while we're on this, you mentioned the topic of Moscow time. So what's Moscow time for people who weren't following that? <laughs> so for people who are not aware, this this, this was born out of. Um, uh, I, I'm not even sure who it was. It, it might have been some 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 journalist or just some journalist, some, think, some yeah. regular guy. I don't know on Twitter. And uh, Jack Dorsey, um, he was uh, appearing on TV and he had uh, his um, block clock block behind block. him. And the block clock was displaying the satoshis per dollar. So. Um, how many Satoshis will you get if you um, buy one US dollar worth of Bitcoin? And I think it, it's at like 1800 something or so. And this guy was, you know, going for d chess in his head and coming up with all kinds of conspiracy theories, how Russia is involved. And like, this is the time in Moscow right now. He, he tries to, sell, <laughs> to tell us something. And all the Bitcoiners, of course, knew, you know, that that was not was, what, what was going on. And <laughs> it was very hilarious. Like it was, it was a, a, a hilarious evening on, on, on Twitter, and this is how Moscow, Moscow time was born. So when Bitcoiners speak about Moscow time now, what they mean is um, the uh, how many satoshis you get for one US dollar. And I think currently we're at uh, in the seventeen hundreds hundreds already, like seventeen I don't know seventeen seventy or something. I only know it because it's the only clock I have in. <laughs> <laughs> in my room, <laughs> it you shows live your life by Moscow time. exactly it uh, because I I used to be a complete time chain maximalist and only had the block height uh, displayed, but now because it was so funny and it's also a nice way to keep track of the horrible price of the, of the US dollar, um, it's um, it's switching between block height and Moscow time for me now. Yeah, and so recently, Gigi, you commented that US dollar is going to one sat implying a $100 million price per Bitcoin. So uh, explain yourself. <laughs> I mean, I think it's it's kind of obvious. Um, it's, I, I mean, uh, I, I don't say this lightly, you know, and, and people also have to put this into context, you know, like, I mean, Twitter, like there is no nuance on Twitter. So you, you just have to <laughs> say outrageous things and, and <laughs> put some oil into the fire. But what I, what I mean is um, that all fiat money's trend to zero. That's, that has been true historically always. So because it is made up and you can produce it at, at, at zero marginal cost, you like there, there is no real cost to producing fiat money. It will always trend towards zero because people, the, the urge to print money is too hard to resist. You know, like there will always be some emergency. We see this over and over again in history. And and so uh, governments and central banks tend to inflate the money supply. And we see this, like everyone should uh, <laughs> have this visualization of the US dollar in their head, where you just see how it devalued, how the purchasing power of the dollar declined over time. And it's just, 
a, a graph that goes down and down and down. It's it's like it's it's like the Bitcoin graph but inverted. It's like the opposite, you know. Like it's it just goes down, 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 and it it goes down exponentially. And it's uh, it's it's kind of wild to see how much um, how much purchasing power the US dollar lost over like a hundred years. And also make no mistake, like the average lifespan of fiat currencies is like I don't know, like thirty years or something. Like it's ridiculous. The dollar is overdue. <laughs> like it's. <laughs> It's a it's a very old girl now, and, and I think uh, she's taking her last breaths, kind of. And it's it's um, if you if you agree with with the fact, uh, kind of like the historical fact that fiat uh, tends to zero, and if you agree with the proposition that Bitcoiners make that Bitcoin is the hardest money we ever had, and so the purchasing power as Bitcoin monetizes is bound to rise, you have those two curves. And I think they're about to intersect. Like you have the parabolic rise of Bitcoin and you have the like exponential decline of the US dollar and other fiat currencies. And there will be a point where Bitcoin takes over. And there will also be a point where the US dollar is worthless, just like the German Reichsmark is worthless. You know, you can only find it in museums. And it's like, I mean, it, it, it has some value still as like a collector's item, maybe, you know, but all other paper currencies, like everything becomes wor worthless if it's if it's just paper. And that's what fiat is. And that's why the logical conclusion is there will be a point in time where one single Satoshi buys you $1. Like that's, that's, that's just the way it is, you know? And if Bitcoin truly finds global adoption, which, which I think uh, it will, I think it will be the, refer the reserve currency of the world, then, you know, the purchasing power of one Satoshi will be larger than most people think. And I think, you know, we see this already with the Lightning Network, for example, like the base unit on Lightning is a million Satoshi, which is uh, one thousandth of a Satoshi. And so there, there is no there is no issue with, um, you know, having one Satoshi being worth a lot. You you can still break it down on, on higher layers. But for global settlement, which is, I think, Bitcoin's final stage kind of um, all you, like that's that's what we <laughs> are still we're still using gold bars for global settlement kind of you know like gold bars and <laughs> warships <laughs> and so bitcoin <laughs> is just uh, the evolution of money in the, in this sense and that's how i see um bitcoin reaching dollar set parity yeah that's a very bullish prediction there and uh, look I, I mean i basically agree with you i don't really disagree with you i uh, i think it's uh just interesting to see that go and it's also funny because if you're looking at it in sats per dollar, as an example, 2,000 sats per dollar implies a Bitcoin price of 50K. 1,000 sats per dollar implies a price of 100K. And then each time it's like, yeah. you know, halving on one is a doubling on the other, right? And so, yeah. Um, it's, I think uh, not, yeah. not many people made the switch yet. So I think reframing it in, in uh, sets per dollar and, and kind of by default telling everyone that the US dollar is the shitcoin here, you know, um, I think it's, it's, it's refreshing for a lot of people that haven't thought about these things deeply because you have to break your fiat reference frame. Otherwise, you will never be able to make sense of Bitcoin, you know, like if you if you always use the US dollar as your base and and the base depreciates massively. I mean, just in the in the last 18 months, I think the, the US expanded the money supply by like 30 percent or something ridiculous. So every 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 model you built in the last 18 months is wrong by at least 30 percent. Like if you use US dollars as your denomination, you know, like it's it's absolutely ridiculous. It's also why uh, when um, Plan B came up with his doctor flow model, you know, my first reaction was like this. this model will completely break to the upside because the US dollar will be worthless uh, quite soon you know like I mean imagine if the eurozone collapses and and some some other like geopolitical waves are made and the US dollar just devalues mass massively then this model doesn't make sense you have to use something else as an anchor and the problem is if there is nothing else for an anchor then you're in deep trouble because you have you have a hard time modeling this and making sense of of the numbers kind of you know like if if only bitcoin is the anchor and you try to put a price on bitcoin then you know it's like a, this self-referential loop that doesn't make sense and i'm saying this because i mean i i know he he later uh, did it with gold and so on but i think bitcoin will devalue gold so you have the same problem just like silver got devalued you know silver was money for thousands of years and now it isn't anymore cowrie shells were money for five thousand years so i don't buy the you know like gold was always money it will always be money argument because at one point in history, cowrie shells were always money, you know, like as far as you look back, cowrie shells were always money, like it's 5,000 year history, like what the hell, cowrie shells will not devalue, we will always use cowrie shells, yeah, no, <laughs> no, we won't. <laughs> and I'm sure at that time people would have said, oh, look, 
it might have been you know people think of it like oh family uh, families are value this and they use it for dowries and whatever or heirlooms and yeah i mean obviously in the gold context <laughs> people say that like oh it's jewelry and air, family yeah. heirlooms and things like that but things will change yeah you know it it really is like people expect that just because you know humans used horses to get around for you know hundreds of thousands of years that they're not going to use cars when cars become available yeah well, sorry got some, you got another thing coming yeah absolutely and I, th- I think most people are not prepared for this you know like just just mentally like i i i, I uh, <laughs> i'm completely fine with most people thinking that i'm i'm an insane crazy person but it, it doesn't it doesn't change the fact that you know there are some uh kind of other dynamics at play very much like the internet it 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 ate up everything because everything you can transform into information will be eaten up by the internet you know like there is a reason why you know we did not step on the plane and uh, we are now speaking virtually and why you don't buy newspapers anymore you know like this is this this was an absolutely outrageous thought that people will stop buying newspapers you know and yet here we are and i think uh, outrageous things are happening all the time in in this day and age kind of and i think it's not outrageous to to say that gold just like silver before it will lose most of its monetary premium you know i mean you can always keep it as a you know like absolutely doomsday scenario hedge you know but but even even if this doom, doomsday scenario comes uh, you know guns and food will be way more important than gold coins so um you know you might just want to sell your gold and build a bunker and get some guns or i don't know what <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think and it's a great point that while we might look like look and sound like the crazy ones now, if you thought back to, let's say, the mid or late 90s, can you imagine someone then saying, oh, hey, you're going to have this little device in your pocket and it can connect to the internet and you can like instantly call and talk to people almost free. You can buy things online for free. And, you'll, and I remember when it used to be, people used to feel really afraid about typing in the credit card details for yeah. any online website it was like whoa yeah. i'm not putting my credit card yeah. details and right now, right like rightfully just... so to be honest you know i mean <laughs> it was terrible and credit card fraud is like uh, i think uh, i don't know it's a, it's a high percentage uh, still and uh, you know back we we did not have uh, https and ssl by default so most of the stuff online was playtext so people uh, whether they knew we're it or not concerned. they were rightly yeah. concerned yeah but but i i, th- I think that the, the smartphone point is such an excellent one because everyone like it's it's just the default now everyone is used to smartphones and it's like you tap on a button on your smartphone and 20 seconds later a car appears magically that brings you everywhere you want to go like you can you can order food and it just appears like an hour later or whatever you can you know go step into virtual realities you can you, you have uh, it's a mapping device that will bring you anywhere everywhere on uh, like you have the library of alexandria at your fingertips and all of that is normal like it's it's completely outrageous that this works and it's also i think completely outrageous that everyone takes it for granted and i think that's that's why also bitcoin will be taken for granted completely and no one will think about it you know just like no one thinks about tcp ip and everything that makes the, the internet work you know there is there is there's so much magic and engineering going on underneath very much like in bitcoin you know there is a lot of magic and engineering going on underneath but you don't have to think about it it just works and i think the same will be true in bitcoin and we see this emerge now already you know like i um i expected this to happen uh, i'm 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 still like i i feel like i'm i'm not bullish enough most of the time because i i get surprised all the time how how fast things develop and now uh, um people are building you know on lightning stuff that we are already using every day you know stuff like uh, apple pay and google pay and you just tap your card and you you pay at the grocery store and you don't have to think about anything and you don't have to do anything and this will work on bitcoin period it will like it's 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 an absolute no-brainer that and people are already working on it and we see now thanks to ellen url and other uh, technologies uh, built on lightning kind of you know that this already works and i i've built it myself you know like i um i i I got a small NFC chip and put a LN URL on it and you can uh, enable NFC on your phone and you tap it and Breeze will open up and you just, you know, hit, yeah, approve and that's it. And you paid. And, and that's the future we're heading to. And most people will not realize um, the switch because financial services and banks and all of it and payment provi- providers, they will have to make the switch. They will have to change. Just like telephone and telecommunication companies, they, have to, they had to use the internet. Otherwise, they would die, you know? Like, you cannot, they have to switch to voice over IP. They have to use the internet infrastructure to do their telephone stuff and everything else, you know? Like, you absolutely have to, 
or, or you will die in the marketplace. And the same will be true for money. Like banks and, and payment providers and everyone else will have to make the switch. But I think that uh, companies like Strike and, and so on, uh, like Bitcoin native companies kind of, they will be the first and they will, they will have a, a, like they will have an advantage and they will have, they will pass on this advantage to their customers. So it will be cheaper to use. It will be lower fees. It will be like more cashback in sets, everything that we are seeing develop already. And very soon you're just going to tap your mobile phone and you're going to pay with strike or whatever. And it's, it's gonna, you, you know, like you, you have a, you have a Satoshi balance. You don't have a US dollar balance. And I think this, this, this switch, you know, it will take a while because it takes a while to drop whatever fiat shitcoin you're using and just think in satoshis and not in dollars or euros or yen or whatever anymore and it but it's it's an absolute no-brainer to me that, that, that this will come and we're already halfway there yeah absolutely i think a lot of people will get caught blindsided because they won't have realized how quickly things will change and obviously those you know, people like you and me and listeners of my show are probably we already are thinking much more about bitcoin more seriously uh, but even for us, it, it, it like for us right now, it's kind of difficult to price everything in sats unless you've got like a computer app that does it. And occasionally I might do a quick comparison, uh, but it, it's, it's just difficult to do that because of how quickly the price moves and things. But over time, it will change. And I think as well, the user experience around these things will change as well. So even wallets are getting easier and easier to set up and use. Uh, do you have any thoughts around where you think things are going in terms of... Uh, wallets and the infrastructure that we use to pay things uh, or to receive uh, in Bitcoin and Lightning? Yeah, um, that's a good question. I think it will it will go in the direction uh, uh, stuff that we are already using. You know, like uh, I think a year ago or so I wrote about the state of uh, the user experience in, in Bitcoin and how absolutely terrible it is. But it's also, you know, to be expected, like it was absolutely terrible to build up a computer network in, in the early 90s or, or what have you, you know, like <laughs> making computers work is is not easy. And so not too long ago, we, we were at this point in Bitcoin where it, everything was very involved and you 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 had to know you know what an xpub is for example and, and stuff like that everything now i think we're already past that you know like the the xpub discussion is kind of over this this is abstracted away users don't have to really care about it i mean there are disaster scenarios and so on where you have to care about it but that's very similar to how your car breaks down and then you could suddenly have to care about how a motor works you know like you <laughs> that's just the, the way things work and i think um in terms of wallets i think we will see very similar things emerge than we had previously because it just makes sense like for example you will have a vault um however this looks like you know it might be a multi-sig it might be collaborative custody it might be time locked and this is like your your <laughs> these are like your family funds you know the, the, the inheritance for your kids and stuff like that and this is the stuff you, that that you do not touch unless you want to buy land or a house or you know something really bad happens and uh, i think we, we will see uh, spending wallets like you know money in your pocket and uh, they will work on lightning and you will have to make different trade-offs kind of um for these different kind of kinds of wallets you know yeah like you you might have a, a desktop wallet or something or like a, a more like more properly secured wallet to receive your salary and to make larger purchases or make recurring purchases and stuff like that. And, you know, like, because you don't want to lose your phone and uh, just, you know, someone else has, I don't know, like a lot of purchasing power. I want to be able to lose my phone and the stuff I have in my wallet shouldn't be like a hundred X what is worth my phone. You know, like that's, <laughs> it's, 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 it, it all comes back to you. You're going to have money in your pocket for daily spending. You're going to have one account for like, you know, weekly and monthly spending. And you, you're you going to have one vault where, you know, things are run a little bit differently, where it's really hard to get money out kind of even for yourself. And this is where most of your sets will end up. Yeah. And so breaking down to maybe one more level is things like teaching people the difference between a Bitcoin on-chain transaction and a Lightning transaction, right? So as an example, you're buying something on a store and maybe that user doesn't understand, oh, I've got a Lightning wallet, I need to use the Bitcoin swap out functionality. Or uh, maybe the store, they don't know, as, a, as an example, they're using BTC pay server and at the top, you need to flick, you need to configure it manually or you need to sort of say, oh, this is an on-chain payment. I would like to pay with Lightning, right? And there's little little things like this where today it's like, I'm, I'm out here trying to teach someone who's new and they don't know these things. So we have to, you know, what, what, do, you, what do you think that looks like over time? Yeah, I think most of this will be abstracted away, but um, 
I also think that there are some things that we must be very careful to not abstract away. You know, there are some things that are insanely important to um, the main idea and the main benefit of Bitcoin, which is, for example, running your own node, holding your own keys. You know, like that's uh, you, you should not ab abstract away too much to, again, like uh, coddle the mind of the user and just uh, become a, a neo bank that is built on Bitcoin and you have the, the gold and warehouse problem all over again and then we will have fractional reserve on Bitcoin and so on. So I think you like we will need to, to strike a balance um, to allow the user to be self-sovereign but also make it easy enough for everyone to understand and I think it's definitely possible and I, f I also feel like we're we're kind of heading in that direction but it will also be different for different types of, of users, you know, like uh, most people just um, probably will not care and they will have to kind of burn their fingers a, a little bit until they they realize what's going on and until they understand. And I think, um, unfortunately, you know, like <laughs> I really like this saying and I, I, I think I heard it first from Alex Vatsky and he was like, you know, there, there's two ways that people learn. It's either through curiosity or through pain. And, and unfortunately, I think, you know, like the, the curious population is, is not the majority. <laughs> it's like most people are not curious about money or Bitcoin and uh, they will have to learn the hard way. But I also think, you know, um, that people are definitely able to learn and understand this. And it's like if you're getting deplatformed, for example, it's very easy to understand what's what's going on. You know, like if your bank account gets frozen, it's very too easy. Uh, it's very easy to understand what's going on. Very similar to the Arab Spring, you know, like if the internet gets shut down by the government, it's very easy to figure out what kind of DNS changes you have to make and how to connect to Tor and other things like, because you have to, like you, your survival depends on it. So, so you're going to learn. And I think the same will be true for Bitcoin that, you know, people will learn the nitty gritty details and the importance of holding their own keys and the importance of multisig, for example, uh, once like, you know, they see someone else uh, suffering the pain or they suffer the pain themselves. Yeah, very prescient comments, I think. I think a lot of people will unfortunately have to learn the hard way. Uh, also, also wanted to touch on your thoughts on operating in this Bitcoin space as a NIM, right? So I, I, I suppose there has been some challenges for you, but also some opportunities for you. Uh, obviously, as you're operating under a NIM, um, people don't know what your real face is you know, it looks like at least online, they don't, uh, what, what has that been like for you? And would you recommend that for other people? <laughs> I definitely do not recommend the full body suit. Like that was a mistake, but now I'm stuck with it. <laughs> <laughs> it gets very hot, but <laughs> you know, life is suffering. So I, I just bite the bullet and uh, I'm going to stick with it. But re regarding the, the upside and the privacy issue, I think, um, it's a very, tricky subject kind of for people to wrap their head, heads around because it's not immediately obviously what you are giving up if you're giving up your privacy. And um, I think in, in the age of uh, Google and Facebook, a lot of people are saying that privacy is dead anyway. And I don't believe that. And that's that's my main motivation behind acting as a NIM, you know, and like, to be fair, I, you know, I'm, I'm not an <laughs> Edward Snowden or I'm not, I'm not like, I, I could be way more careful, you know, like uh, if, if, if I would be someone who is actually afraid of, of doxing themselves or something like that, I wouldn't go to conferences. I wouldn't show my face ever. I would not speak, you know, like there are ways to, to do something with your voice where you can, you know, like uh, guess how your face looks like. Like, like voice modulation uh, yeah, yeah. and things. Now, I mean, yeah, yeah, exactly. So you, you have to be m way more careful than I, than I am if, you, if you're in serious danger, um, uh, which I am obviously not. So for me, it's more like I want to show that um, you don't have to dox yourself all the time to everyone, you know? Like I think privacy is about selectively revealing yourself. And I, I choose to selectively reveal myself to, to friends and, you know, to people I, I work with and uh, to, you know, select individuals that uh, I, I trust. But uh, I, just, I just want to also kind of, everyone should realize how, how, um, how fast things can change. And also like it's, if it's super easy to find out everything about you with like two, <laughs> two minutes of Googling, then that's not a good situation to be in. And it's, it's, uh, it's it's not that I'm you know like uh, truly afraid or anything like that. I I just think it's not it's not a good state for a society to be in because with the ledger leak and other data leaks, for example, you know I can figure out okay. 
those million people, probably all of them own some Bitcoin or some shitcoins. Some of them, they are five minutes away from me and I know their name and I know their exact address, including, you know, the door I, I need to, to knock at. And this is, this is not the situation you want to be in. So you, you should be careful about your privacy. And I think in, in general, more people should be more careful about their privacy or at least take steps to reduce their online footprint. And there are great tools to do that. You know, like you, you can use a VPN, you can use better browsers, you can use better operating systems. You can just, you know, like not use your real name and your, your face for everything all the time. And I think I also like, you know, I think it's, it's deeply embedded in the, in the Bitcoin culture that, you know, identity is not required. You can use your identity if you want, but it's not required. It's also not required in the Bitcoin system. You know, Bitcoin only requires a valid signature. Who generated the signature doesn't matter. It could be a dog. It could be a computer program. It can be any person, you know, it, it can be, uh, uh, like a group of people and so on. Like, like identity should not matter for, for those kind of things. And I think also for, for example, for discussing ideas and stuff like that, I also think it should not matter. You know, like I'm, I'm a huge fan of, of pen names and, and just people throwing out ideas and discussing them and not focusing so much on the people. Yeah, and that's a interesting advice for people out there who might want to start writing in the space or maybe they want to get hired in the space. Maybe they're thinking, how do they build up a profile? Well, I think you've done that as an example that you've got a name and a profile within the space um, despite not doxing your real name and real face out to the world uh so that's an example that other people can look at and even things like if you go to a bitcoin meetup you could you could sort of make sure you don't tell your real name or you might ha have a nickname that you go by that you're known as um it's someone like say, it's, Oak, it's like also Sivanon, also but... the old tricks you know just put on a hat and put on sunglasses and no one will recognize you it actually <laughs> it actually works so <laughs> I think, right. Yeah. Yeah. I think people underestimate uh, uh, the the facial recognition software that humans are running. But you know, like speaking of that point, um, uh, we are living in a world now where um, we have superhuman facial recognition software and also speech recognition and all of it. So um, I think all of this should be taken into consideration if you're thinking about um, you know like just thinking about doing something online. You know, because uh, for example, I can I can take your face take a screenshot and put it into a re reverse uh, image search engine and there are special engines that do reverse uh, facial recognition search and i will find you know your profiles and your linkedin profile and, and everything like this this already works and people people should just be aware of it and then do with that information what they want and make their own decisions yeah yeah very good tips there all right so as we finish up then um What's your, I guess, uh, outlook over the next, uh, you know, uh, next year or so? What do you have any thoughts about what's coming to Bitcoin or what you'd like to see? Hmm. Yeah. Huh, that's a good question. I think, I think, um, I think Bitcoiners will continue to be right. I think that might be a nice summary. I think more money will come in, definitely. I think um, once we truly soar past the old all time highs, more and more people will realize, okay, um, Bitcoin is not that again, you know, what's going on. I think we, I, I think every individual needs like two or three touch points with Bitcoin and then it really clicks sometimes, you know, some people need four or five or, or, or just, you know, go the opposite direction, <laughs> still think it's stupid, but, um, it's very hard to get Bitcoin at, at like the first point. And I think culturally as like a global society, um, we will have. Uh, a lot of people will have the third touch point with Bitcoin, you know, like there was Mt. Gox, there was 2017, and I think the next one is coming. And I think for a lot of people, it will click. And I think for a lot of people with a lot of money and a lot of power, um, it will click as well. And they will make uh, big moves just like Michael Saylor did, for example, you know, and we see what well, I did not expect um, nation states coming in so quickly. Like, I'm still very surprised that this happened. Uh, like so early, I was I was having this on my calendar for like uh, 2024, 2025, something like that. And here we are a couple of years early and El Salvador made Bitcoin legal tender and you can go to the McDonald's and, you know, pay <laughs> your cheeseburger with lightning and, and, and all of it. I think this is, um, yeah, I think it's both both exciting and a little bit frightening because uh, my biggest worry in Bitcoin is that things are happening too quickly because it, it will need some time for 
um, a shared understanding to emerge for um, like sensible legislation, for example, to emerge for people to know what they are doing for, you know, just the liquidity to kind of flow into the system and, uh, you know, also the volatility to decline and, and so on and so forth. And I think also lightning and higher layers um, just need time to develop and grow and uh, be battle tested, you know, like there is a lot of value on lightning already and uh, it feels to me like it was yesterday when the the lightning white paper came out you know so everything happened insanely quickly in terms of wallets and um, use experiences again i think it will get easier to use and i think also that uh, just for example setting up your own multisig it's already way 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 easier than it was like one and a half years ago you know like people will actually be able to do this um, I'm, I'm still surprised that we don't see a lot of time locks yet. I, I expect I expect this to happen as well, where you you know like you have a child and you time lock a few sets away for like 14 years and then again for 18 years and again for 21 years and that's like you know uh, I, I think that would be a very nice thing to do. But of course, all of this um, comes with certain risks. Um, I'm again I'm most excited about Lightning and stuff built on lightning kind of um so a lot of experiments were already built like sphinx chat and other things you discussed a lot on your on your show where um you just have encrypted communication built on top of the lightning network which is a very censorship resistant network so i think this will be very important for a free society to have these kind of tools and I think um, I'm super bullish, for example, on new monetization models that are currently emerging, like the value for value model championed uh, by Adam Curry and uh, just podcasting 2.0 where you can stream sets and, you know, you can you can boost if you like something, which is like clapping with your sets and you can send small little messages like boostograms and you can just, you know, set the Satoshi amount you want to stream per, per minute and you can support creators directly. And I think this will completely destroy the advertising model or at least change it in a very meaningful way. And I see this not only for podcasts, but happening across all media. So for articles as well, it will be very easy to integrate Lightning in all those platforms. And I think more and more platforms will integrate Lightning, you know, just like we saw Twitter integrated Lightning tipping natively, you know, not not everyone and not, not in the perfect way, you know, but <laughs> like, you know, the Bitcoiners are up in arms that it's not perfect on the first day, but I think it will, it will get perfected over time. And I think more and more platforms will integrate that. And yeah, that's, that's where I see things heading. Fantastic. Well, big changes coming to all of our lives. So listeners, go and find Gigi online. It's D-E-R-G-I-G-I dot com or follow him on Twitter. Same handle, D-E-R-G-I-G-I. -G -G Thanks very much, Gigi. It was great to chat with you. Thanks for having me again, Stefan.